what a gift it is uh, that you've given us to be here. Uh, we, we pray that you uh, truly are glorified today. Uh, Lord, I pray as we uh, consider your word this morning, uh, Lord, that you would apply it into our hearts and our lives, and Lord, that, uh, you would reign in each of our lives, uh, Lord, that we would exalt you uh, in all things. And Father, I pray this uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, <clears throat> I... Uh, was thinking this week, I, I recall last year my family, we took a vacation down to Newport. And if you've never been to Newport, this is down in Newport, Oregon. We had a great time. Uh, and one specific thing, event stuck out to me. There was, there was just a lot of fun. Anytime you take, at that point we had six kids and because uh, Savannah had not been born yet. Um, anytime you take six kids and me and, and my wife somewhere, it, it's, it's just fun. And so we had a great time. But one thing that we did while we were there is we went on this, it's kind of a tour boat. You go out and you go past the jetty and, and you go and you, you go around. And, and it was a blast because here me and Nolan and Creighton and Malachi are sitting the, uh, at the front of the boat, woo and riding the waves. And then some lady comes up, hey, your wife needs you. And my wife was six months pregnant sitting in the middle of the boat. <laughs> I go back, I'm going to throw up. And she runs to the back of the boat, leans over, blah, and throws up. And I thought, this is cool. And, and then I turned, and there's little Ian cry, crying, terrified, with this look of sheer terror. And he's setting his sister off, and she's crying, and Crean is bawling her. And this was the greatest thing ever. And so he, Creighton and Malachi and Nolan are leaning over, trying to touch the water, all this stuff. And, and so we had this fun time. But as we're going out, and, and we're coming around the jetty, and the, the waves are hitting, the captain says, hey, you see that over there? Now, I don't know if you know what a jetty is. I didn't realize this until we've done this. I don't know a whole lot about the ocean. But they build basically these walls of rocks. And what happens is the jetty blocks the waves from coming in. So when you come into the harbor or you come into the bay, which is where we were, the, the water's calm. And you have to get in there. Otherwise, it's going to crash you into the, into the side of the uh, shore. And so we're going out, and he says, look over there. And, and we look over, and there's the sailboat. And it's this giant, big, really big. I, to me, it looked like a yacht, but I think it's just some guy's sailboat. And, and he goes, well, there was a guy yesterday that crashed that, and he was, he's from Portland, and he's, he was going to go down all the way down to South America, and, and he was going on this cruise. And what he did was as he was turning, he thought he was turning into the jetty. Well, what ended up happening, turning into the, the harbor, and what he did is turn too soon, and it crashed him up against the rocks. And he thought he was doing, what everything he was doing was right, and he turned and boom, it crashed. I thought, oh my goodness. And, and so I, before I could even say anything, because uh, I thought, well, how in the world are they going to get this boat out of here? And the captain came over and, and said, well, they'll never get that boat out. It's going to be destroyed in the next couple days. It'll just sink right there. And I thought, well, that's terrible, this poor guy. All this investment in this boat, and then he crashes it, and it's done. And as, it's interesting to consider that as we look now, we're going to turn our attention to Timothy. If you've been with us, we just finished Romans last week, and we're going to jump ahead to, to Timothy, 1 Timothy, and we're going to take what I call a survey through Timothy. We're going to, cut, we're going to go through Timothy very quickly. Uh, we'll cover the entire book in four weeks. And to, to think of what a survey is when we do this for preaching, uh, if you think of it in terms of a helicopter, when we went through Romans, we would kind of go up and look at the landscape, and then we drop down in and get a real close look at what's going on, and then we pull back up and drop out. What we're going to do with Timothy is we're just going to stay at cruising altitude and cruise right through it. And so we're going to look at 1 Timothy, and there's some interesting things about this book that we need to pay attention to. First off, this is a book that's written to a pastor. Last time, and most of the other books that we've done, especially with Paul's epistles, are really, they're, they're written to a group of people. Paul's epistles, as we went through, Romans was written to the church at Rome. And it was intended to be read in front of the church, and, and then they would apply it into their lives and, and into the fabric of the church. This is written to a young pastor. Every month, uh, myself and Bill Deller head over to his place, which is one of our sister churches in Post Falls, and we meet with other pastors that are there. And it's, this is kind of, when I, when I think of Timothy, I kind of think of this as you got an older pastor who's coaching and developing a younger pastor. And really, for, for all intents and purposes, we can look at this and think of this as, this is kind of a peek behind the veil to see what goes on. How does a pastor instruct another pastor? And that's kind of what we get here with 1 Timothy. But I want to set the stage a little bit because we are going to cruise through this pretty quickly. I, I want to set the stage a little bit so you kind of get a, the gist of the backdrop of the book before we really jump into it. And hopefully this will... Can you activate me there, John? I don't think it's highlighted on the, the right slide there. There we go. And so 
The, the occasion for this is really, uh, the, the, if you think of this, Paul's first Roman imprisonment, he gets out, he goes down into Crete, drops off Titus there, and Paul's intention is to go on to Macedonia, but he's going to stop off in Ephesus, and he's got uh, Timothy and Titus with him. Drops Titus off in Crete, heads up to Ephesus, and, and says, oh my goodness, this is a disaster. It leaves Timothy to fix things while he heads off to Macedonia. And so that's really kind of what's going on. And, and one of the problems that happens is if you remember back in Acts, Paul, when he, after he planted, he was heading off, uh, leaving the church at Ephesus. He stated to the elders of the church in Acts 20, 28, and 29, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you and not spare the flock. And so this is really what we're seeing here in 1 Timothy is this has been lived out. And, and Paul's coming through and he realizes the wolves have come in and they're devouring the flock. And so this church is in a, in a bad state. And so that's the whole purpose of Paul leaving Timothy behind. And as we read through the letter, there's going to be specific things that are addressed uh, as Paul writes to Timothy. Uh, one of those is the false teachers specifically surrounding them. Uh, false teaching on obedience to the law. And, and what was being taught there is, is really they didn't know what they were teaching for one. But two, they were teaching really you have to follow the law instead of following, focusing on the grace and mercy. And so we have a, a false teaching that's there. And what ultimately happens with that, and as we'll see as we go through the book, uh, is this is going to create a judgmental and critical approach to worshiping God. Uh, it's going to create factions and divisions within the body of Christ. Well, I wear, I wear this, and then you wear that, so you can't be a part of me. Or, or, you know, th various things like that, or, and so that's ultimately what we, we start running into. Uh, false teachers are targeting young women and inciting them to be useless and lazy. I think that's funny. <laughs> young women are the target. And we're going to get into that because really, who did Satan go after in the garden? He went after Eve. That's going to be a big deal because in the church there are some, some things that we have to address and that's going to happen throughout this book of why, why is it that the young women are targeted uh, and, and then ultimately uh, with these false teachers are persuading the women to follow them. Uh, thirdly, there's new leadership in the church is necessary. Uh, Timothy, we're going to go through as we come through this book, how does leadership in the church develop? Who is a leader? Who's qualified to be a leader in the church? And we have to consider all of that. Uh, Timothy needs to guard the truths of the faith. Um, as we see is specific, specifically today, the, the truths of the faith have been lost, and they're following after other various things. And so Timothy's job is to, to teach them, not only for him to guard it, but to teach them. And then finally, the coffers were low because of the false teachers. Now most likely, and when I say that, most likely what's happened here is all the offerings have gone, and they've either spent the money on, on useless things, or they've pilfered them themselves. And, and so that's, that's some of the stuff there. And so we would see with that that greed is an underlying problem within this church. And so with that, if you have your Bibles, let's jump into 1 Timothy. We're going to cover the entire first chapter today. Uh, we're going to do it in two separate chunks. Uh, we'll start off in 1 Timothy 1. I'll read down through verse 11. We'll stop and kind of parse out what's going on there. And then we'll jump in and read the rest of the chapter after that. So beginning in verse 1 of 1 Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior, and Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, in order to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculation rather than the stewardship, of, uh, stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the uh, blessed God with which I have been entrusted. And so we'll stop there and we'll kind of make sense of this a little bit. So really what we, we have right at the gates is Paul's leaving Timothy and he gives him, he identifies this is the problem in this church. Now we have to remember this is really a letter being written to a pastor but also, I think as we look at the church in Ephesus, as we, as we consider this, 
I think it, it does bear in mind, we have to remember that this is the same church that Christ wrote about in Revelation or that's written of in Revelation. You've lost your first love. And I think we can apply much of what we're going to read here today into our own personal lives and for many of us our walk with Christ of what happens when we end up taking a wrong step and we end up following false doctrine. And so it starts off with what are these false doc what are these guys uh, not doing? Well, they're not focusing on the right things. And so that when we look at that, one of the things that we have to focus on in the body of Christ is specifically the Word of God. And I find it interesting because I've heard from, actually it's been several people that have gone to other churches and that and they come back and they, they talk with me and, and they'll tell me, you know, it's interesting, I went to this one church and, and they didn't even, the guy never opened the Bible. And I, that's, a, that's astounding because I, how in the world do you, what do you preach from? How do you, what am I going to tell you if I, if I stand up here I'm going to tell you crack, wisecracks and jokes which usually aren't very funny. But really, what, what, what is there to stand on? And, and ultimately, that's kind of what we're seeing happen here at the church at Ephesus. They're going through what they call, what Paul says, uh, these endless genealogies. And there's a couple reasons why people would do that. Um, we, have to, we have to really kind of parse this out a little bit. I, I think we have a, there's a cult in our area that does this very thing. And they have a false doctrine uh, that, that really you don't find in Scripture where they're praying for the dead. And, and nowhere in Scripture do you find that. That's not something we do. It, it, we, we do find it's appointed when a man wants to die and then judgment. That's, that's what we find. And so once you're dead, you're dead. And, and I don't know if you knew that, but it's over. You stand before God and he says, okay, where are you? And we'll get into that in a little bit later. But, but there's this notion of if I, if I find enough people that I can pray for them. And, and that's, that's not a right, that's an incorrect doctrine. It's, it's really, essentially, it's heretical is what we would say with that. Um, but then there's also this notion of when we look at these endless genealogies, what I think is most likely going on and, and more uh, effectively going on um, is really what they're doing is I want to look at this genealogy and I want to find where's my high status. Because what we want to do is I, I want to build upon somebody else's status and take credit for that. Because, well, look at my line. I have this king back in, you know, whenever or whatever. And this, I have this other teacher that's this philosopher. And these, this is my, so I rightly, I'm from the right lineage and I should be leading. And we call this nepotism now. And, and nepotism, there's a problem with that in the body of Christ. And so if we look at this, we do have an example of this in 1 Samuel. Subsequently, if you're new to Crossroads or if you're just joining us, uh, we're going to go through 1 Timothy. 1 Samuel is going to be the next book we go through. I'm really excited about that. And so, but in 1 Samuel, we see a, a picture of this, uh, specifically with Eli. And in 1 Samuel 2.12, it says, Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. And then down in verse 22 and 24 of the same, uh, same uh, chapter, we see, Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all of Israel. How they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, it is not a good report that I hear the people of the, of the Lord spreading abroad. And if we contrast that, these are the guys that are there because of birth. That's their, that's their birth. They're, that's their position because of that. And then we contrast that with Samuel, which it says later on in that same chapter. Now the young man Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord also with man. So when we look at this dynamic of why would I want to go through these genealogies, why would I want to establish that this is my rightful spot, is because I want to circumvent the fact of the matter that I need to actually be called by God to do this. And what's interesting in this is, is you see this in churches, and I have, you know, most of you know, I have seven children. I'm convinced one of them had better be a pastor, or I'm going to be really upset. No, I don't. They, they could do whatever they want. But I, I look at a couple of us and, and they say, I'm going to go do this. Say, no, you're not. I, I know your heart. You're going to be a pastor. And, and so I do these subtle things to shape them that direction. But we, and they, they don't know I'm doing it. Except the one that's filming me right now. Because I just told him. But, but we, we have to look at this in terms of, we really kind of look at this notion of, of how this works. And ultimately, let's, I said this last week, at some point, God's going to call me out of the pulpit and, and into some other thing. And, and I, I, you know, that, that may be 20 years from now. It, it may be if Sonny has his way tomorrow, but we'll it'll be okay whenever it is. But at that point, it doesn't just automatically go to my kid. And, and that's ultimately nepotism. A lot of times we'll bring pastor's kids onto staff at churches. Without, are they qualified? And, and re, we have to consider that. Are they called? Are they qualified? Is, is this even a role that they should be in? And that's so vital and important because that can be destructive in a church. And I've seen this happen. 
And so we, we have to look at that's that notion of nepotism. Just because I'm a preacher doesn't mean my kid's going to be any good at it. You might even question, am I even good at it? <laughs> and that's okay. Just put those to Sonny and he'll answer it for you. But, but really what we can look at here is, is this notion of, of that, that's this concept of, well, it's in my bloodline. I rightly deserve this. And we forego the nature of, are you really called to this position? Are you qualified as a leader in the body of Christ? And the second thing they're doing is they're focusing on fables. And I believe this because they're doing this because they are unqualified. What starts to happen in the church is, is if I'm preaching from something other than God's word, I, let's, let's be realistic. We can use, I can use fables and myths as a sermon illustration, but it better not be the point of my sermon. You know, it better be, the point of my sermon better be grounded in God's word. Because if I'm focusing on Superman, I better be able to make a link between Superman and Jesus somehow. Otherwise, it's going to be Superman and you should all live up and be like Superman. But that's this notion of, of presenting DC Comics preaching. And, and the teaching there, and we're looking at, well, this, look at the status of this individual, this hero that we'd have, and we should all live to be. No, really, it's grounded in God's word. And if you want a hero, it's Christ. And so that's the, this notion of there. And, and ultimately, when we start doing that, we deviate away from the word of God. And I have to really just bring it back to where in the world do we find salvation? Where is God's plan for salvation? It's in God's word. And it's God's plan for your salvation, and you get to be a part of it. But when we deviate away from that, all to all, what we start to do is we start teaching these false doctrines, and that's what's happening. And so the, the opening portion says, if you want to look foolish in church, I guess that's what you do. But really, to look a, like a student and know what you're doing, you better be grounded in God's Word, teaching the truth. And then secondly, don't be unqualified. And I find this interesting that these guys were teaching the law, and Paul says this, essentially says this of them, that they don't even know what they're talking about. And that's interesting to me, because how often do people, I, I get in conversations with Christians a lot, and they'll say something, and, I, and, and for me, I have to be gracious, because a lot of times I'm like, that doesn't make any sense what you said. And then I, I'll try to graciously correct them, because I know sometimes I say things that make no sense, and I want them to graciously correct me. But really, when we're talking about this, as far as a teacher in this position, in this role, is specifically what Timothy's in, is these guys are, are really, they're teaching false things, and Timothy's going to have to set this right. But they don't know the use of the law. That brings me to the question of, do we know the use of the law? We're, we're in the New Testament, or the, the church age is what a lot of us will refer to it as. Do we know how the law applies into our lives? And Paul is, uh, establishes it and states it, but do we get it? Because you, I, I see that a lot of times if we look at the landscape of churches in America, we, we have people that, like us, I think we fall kind of in the middle on this and we teach it uh, hopefully fairly well-rounded. But there are some churches that will teach from a legalistic doctrine or a legalistic dogma. And ultimately what that is is, is I'm not going to deal with God's grace and mercy. I'm just going to deal with the law. And so if I just deal with the law, guess what? You're all going to look terrible. And I'm going to pound it home, and you're going to try to look as good as you can, and it doesn't matter what's going on on the inside, because you got to just, I guess, got to fit this, i got to meet these dogma, these criteria, these religious prescriptions and proscriptions, and if I do that, I'm okay, and I'm more righteous than the guy next to me. That's what starts to happen with that. We start to develop these religious, and, and oftentimes they're traditions, there's nothing wrong with a tradition until it becomes a legalistic or religious pr uh, prescription that you have to do that. And so we have that notion there, and then the, the second side of it, what I see more prevalent now in, in the modern church, is we're not going to deal with the law, we're just going to deal with God's grace and God's mercy. I don't want to deal with the status of man. There's a major problem with that. We get into what we call, I, I refer to as liberal Christianity. Anything goes. You've been saved by grace, you've been saved, but you can do whatever you want. Never really acknowledging the true status of what humanity is and what's really at the core and, and at the heart of people. And that's that, so both of these have a problem. And so we have to look at this and understand how appropriately or how, how do we actually utilize this. And I was thinking of, of some various things, examples that I could do. And, and, and I thought, you know, there's a guy that does this that I'm just going to try to mimic. And, and it's not going to be as good, so I'm going to encourage you to go and, and watch him on YouTube or, or one of his websites. Um, it's Ray Comfort, and I'm not, some of you probably know who Ray Comfort is. Um, you can go and check him out on YouTube, or you can check him out. I think it's Living Waters is his new ministry, uh, but he also is at the Way of the Master. But he has this, does this street evangelism that is fascinating, and I, I will show it. I've shown it to the youth uh, when I was doing youth. I've shown it to uh, the young adults, and he does something that is so fantastic. 
He will take somebody who's, who's basically denying God and he will get them to at least acknowledge, oh man, I'm in trouble. And, and I, I find it fascinating when somebody can do that. And so I thought, you know, we'll play the game. And, and he doesn't call it a game. It's not really a game. But I thought for us, it, we'll, we'll just look at this as the, the rape comfort, where are you going to go when you die game? And so really, and the, the way this works is if we want to really and, and accurately and correctly appro apply the law, we have to do this. So let's say we have a judge who's sitting on a bench sitting there and he's a good judge and we know he's a good judge a murderer comes in we got him on videotape you got a videotape of him murdering you got eyewitnesses all this all the evidence is stacked up everybody knows this guy is guilty what's the judge going to find They'll find him guilty he weighs the evidence finds him guilty and so then there's a sentence court now if he's a just judge he's going to find him guilty now what if the murderer says well, yeah but i just did that one thing i've got all these other things that i did were good what does it matter anymore is this one act called it makes you guilty so we're going to take that, I want to apply that into our lives. And so we look at this in terms of, are you guilty? And so if you're sitting here today and you're saying, I don't know if I'm guilty. We have a holy God that established laws for humanity. And if you, let's see if you're actually guilty. Have you ever, and I want you to answer this, and I want you to say it proudly. Have you ever stolen anything? Yes. yes. What does that make you? A thief. a thief. Have you ever lied? Yes. What does that make you? So you are a lying thief. You're terrible people. <laughs> now we're really going to get it. Now this is mostly for the older folks. Have you ever looked at a woman or a man with lust in your heart? Yes. And nobody wants to admit. The answer is yes. And, and so we say, so now you're a lying, stealing, adulterer. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes. yes. A lying, stealing, adulterous, blasphemer at heart. So God's a just God, and, and he's established this law. You stand before him. What's he going to find you? Yeah. You're guilty. And that's really what we're looking at here when we talk about what's the application of the law. It's for you to be established of, I'm guilty, and I'm in trouble. And, and that's the reality of when we, when we come face to face with the, who are we genuinely. At my heart, this is what pours out. Do you know nobody taught me how to lie? Nobody taught me how to steal? Nobody taught me how to, how to do any, any, any of the sins. That, was, that just comes naturally, man. And, and I'm good at it. And I struggle with that. And, and just like everybody else in the room, I'm saying this about me, but I'm really talking about you. So, so I want you to hear that. Oh, man, he knows. But, but really, what we look at here is this application into our lives. We have to understand that. The use of the law is to identify, here's God's standard, and you suck. Not really. That's Steve's words. You can interpolate that however you want. But really, that's what ultimately we're dealing with here is, I fall way short. And that's, the, that's where grace and mercy comes in. And that's the gloriousness of Christ. Because then you can literally say, I'm guilty. And then Jesus says, yeah, but I paid the price. Do you want the gift? Amen. And so we have to look at this in terms of, really, that's the, the whole notion of what is the usefulness of the law for us. It's to identify your guilty. Now, it's interesting because we live in a culture where people want to accept things that aren't necessarily true. <coughs> they want to deny what God's Word says, what it, what it says what it says, and they want to add to it or take away from it. But i got to be honest with you. If I'm driving, it, I think it's 20 miles. I don't know how fast it is in a school zone. But if I'm driving 45 in a school zone, I get pulled over. And, I, and the police officer comes up to my door and knocks on my door and says, Hey, knucklehead, what are you doing? Let me see your license and registration. And, I, and he tells me, you know how fast you're going? Yeah, I was going 45. I said, well, the speed limit, and he says, the speed limit's 20. I said, well, that might be true for you. But that's not true for me. It <coughs> doesn't make any sense, does it? The law is the law. And so we get that when it comes to things like that. But all too often when it comes to God's word, well, I don't really want to believe that. I think maybe that maybe it's 20 kind of-ish. And, you know, on certain days we'll make it 20. But really, I want the law to be this. And so I want to disregard this portion. And that's what we find happens a lot. And Paul goes through this list of this is who the law is designed. It's designed for people that are actively engaging in violations of the law. So they can look at it and say, I am guilty. I need God's grace. And but all too often, if, if we, and, and really for us as the body of Christ, if we start to marginalize that, and say, well, it's okay, like one major denomination did this week. This, this action, this is okay, this sin is okay. No, it's, it's still sin. I don't get to change it because I want to change it because I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you're a sinner. And it doesn't do me any good to soften the blow. Because you have to stand before God, not before me. 
And that's ultimately when we talk about the use of the law, it is designed to convict you of sin so that you turn to God and say, man, I need God's grace. And that's, the, that's when we deviate away from that, what we start to get into is, well, I can, I can adjust it how I want, or maybe I can meet these standards of the law, and that makes me a little bit better. And that's not the use of the law. And as we go on, that brings up God's grace and mercy, and that drives us, and that's ultimately what the law will do, is drive you towards God, if it's appropriately used. Because either, either you're left standing there saying, I'm guilty, and I'm okay with that, because you do have a choice. You see, justice is going to be served, whether you acknowledge the grace of God or not. But you're justified, and it has very little to do with you. And I underline little there, because there is a portion you play in this. You've been given free will by God to choose Him. You can either choose to follow God, choose to accept the gift or not. That's your contribution to your salvation. It's you accept it by faith or you deny it. He did all the heavy lifting. He did all the work. He leads you right up to the trough and says, drink. And you can refuse it or you can accept it. And that's one of the things that, that is fascinating. So, so really, when we talk about that, that's, that's what we're getting at when it comes down to this gospel. And, and when churches deviate, or when, when realistically when we start to deviate away from that, what starts to happen is we teach some false gospel that's something different that doesn't draw people into a salvation with a holy God. And Paul states in, in Timothy here in, in verse 11, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, which, has been entr which we've been entrusted... Ultimately, when it comes down to it, the foundational principle of a church is to be based on God's Word and ultimately the Gospel of Jesus Christ because the full counsel of God's Word draws you in to a relationship with God through Christ. Amen. There is nothing else. Everything else should, de or should come out of that. So all the ministry we do, guess what? It should come out of that. Everything we do as far as ministry within the body, guess what? It should come out of that. Everything that we do should be centered around this Gospel. That we serve a holy and a just God, and ultimately I'm accountable to Him. Everything we do, we should permeate not only the life of the church, but the life of a believer. And see, ultimately what happens is when we misapply this, we create division within the body. When we deviate from that, do you realize that the closer I get to God, the dirtier I am? And I don't like that. That's not very comfortable. But then I look and I think, well, if I'm this dirty, boy, Sonny's got to be terrible. <laughs> That's why I picked on Sonny enough. His wife's not here, so I can pick on him. But we, we ultimately we, we get this, and we, the closer we get, the more we realize, oh man, I'm a disaster. And then we get to see how great God's grace is. And that's one of the beautiful things about this. But when we misapply this, what we ultimately, so what a lot of times starts to happen is I start to build myself up and think I'm a little more important than I actually am. And, and that's, that's a travesty when that starts to happen in the body of Christ. Yeah. And that brings us back to, so we have this notion here where this is where Timothy's there. This is kind of a backdrop of what's going on, and the mission for Timothy is simple. Remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Timothy's job is fix it. This is, and I don't know if you've ever been in a position where, where somebody has, something's broken. And this has happened to me when, the, when I was the associate pastor here. And this would happen, and, and it was done in grace. But a lot of times there would be things like, well, just fix it. And, and it happens for me now with, with my staff. If, if they bring something to me, I don't know, fix it. Because ultimately there's a lot of, Paul's got this other ministry. Paul's, by the way, heading off to jail in Rome again where he's going to die. And so we, with that, Paul's got a little bit going on. He leaves Timothy behind because he's got these other churches he needs to minister to. Timothy, fix it. And, and, you have to, and ultimately, this is going to be very difficult. And then we see in verse 5, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good, uh, a good conscience and sincere faith. And, and that's how he's going to fix it. He's got to have a pure heart. He's going he's to have to do this in love and have a good conscience. Now, Last week I spoke briefly and, and, and a little bit about uh, other pastors because I, I get to meet with other pastors. And there, there are some pastors who are called to resurrect the dead. And I don't know if you want to know what that means. They're called to go into dying, dead and dying churches and fix it. That is not my call. I would come into a dying church and I would say, well, this thing's dead. Let's just kill it and start over. And ultimately, some of them, that's the end product as well. They, they know this thing ain't coming back. That has got to be, I, I'm convinced as a pastor, that has got to be one of the hardest. That's harder than planting a church. 
Because you plant a church, if you don't know much about church planting, you look at a church as an organism. It's not just an organization, it's a body. It's a body of believers and it takes on a life. And, and you get to, at the very beginning, put in the DNA what you want that body to look like. And so you, you have that, and that's God's call on you to do that. But if you go into a dying church, guess what's in the DNA? Whatever caused it to die. And that is a difficult task, because oftentimes you've got people in those churches that don't want the church to be saved. They, they think they do, and they'll tell you, yes, we want you to come in and save this church. And they don't realize they're the ones killing it. And it's well, we've got to change this. No, I don't want to change that. Why not? Because that's what we've always done. Well, we got to teach like this. No, I don't want you to teach like that. Why not? Because that's not how we've ever been taught. So you want it to stay the same way it's always stayed, but then bring it back to life. And that's ultimate, That's the call of something. And that's ultimately the, the spot where I see Timothy at here with his church in Ephesus, is resurrect the dead. Now, I don't think it's too far gone because the, Paul's been able to come through, but, but, but ultimately that's the call. And that is a difficult, difficult call. And, and if you think of that in your own life, there are often times when we wander away from the faith, we wander away from God, and we find ourselves off and, and we're hitting the jetty and we're running into it, and ultimately we're going, well, God, I need some help. And God says, I gave you help, and I keep offering you help, but you won't receive it. How many times I've sat down with folks whose lives are destroyed and, and they, they come to me for counsel or, or they come to one of our elders or staff for counsel and, and we, we counsel them and we say, well, these are some things in your life that, that are destroying you, but I don't want to get rid of it. And what are you coming to me for? You just want to steer into the rocks. And, and it's very sad when we see this and, and you see this the closer you get to people that a lot of times you're just watching them and they're going to steer right into the rocks and you see it and you warn them, hey, you're going this direction. This issue in your life, this sin in your life is going to take you and destroy you. And it's going to destroy those around you. But I don't want to change. And that's ultimately how we, we look at this in our lives. And, and I'm standing here today, if that's you, if you're in the midst of something where your life is headed the wrong direction, stop! Get right back, get right with God, start following God with obedience and get the right direction. It comes back and it has to be centered back in God's Word. Understand the, no, the notion God loves you enough that He's going to save you wherever you're at, but He loves you too much to leave you there because you're a dirtbag. Not necessarily all of you. Just most of you. But God loves you too much to leave you there. And that's really when we come down to it, that's ultimately when we, we, we have this struggle between the flesh and, and, and the truth that's in God. We always tend to go to the flesh. And that leads us into the jetty and we crash our boat and we start sinking. Are you willing to accept the help? You see, there's a lot of churches, and I, I said this last week, we're in the, in the remnants in a building of a church that died. What happened? At some point, something went wrong and they didn't right the ship. You're in seats of a church that died. At some point, something went wrong and they didn't right the ship. They didn't listen. They didn't go back to God's word. They didn't get about what God's business was about. Churches can last a long time. And, and ultimately, when it comes down to the, many of the meetings that we have from elder board, for the elder board and the deacons, it's not, what are we going to, the part of it is, what are we doing this next six months? But it's also, what are we doing for the next 20 years? And, and are we shaping the kids? Are we shaping the youth? Are we developing them because they're taking over? This isn't us 20 years from now. Could you imagine me in 20 years? You don't want to hear me that long. Good grief, you want some, some young buck to come in here and tell you what things are all in and apply it. But, but ultimately, we have to look at this in terms of, really, that's the, the notion within your life. It's not what's going on right now. It's what's going to happen 20 years from now. Are you allowing God to shape it and direct it? And that brings us into, how do we do this? And so we, we, we'll jump back into verse 12 and we'll finish the rest of the chapter. So 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 12. I thank Him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because He judged me faithful, appointing me to His service. Although formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, insolent, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in time 
uh, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were believed in him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, and the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage a good warfare, holding faith, <clears throat> holding faith and good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hyamanus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And this, this starts off interesting to me because oftentimes when we consider who Paul is, I, I kind of have Paul built up in my head as this great evangelist, this great, great disciple, this great apostle. This is him in my head. And, and I don't know that that's entirely accurate. And if we look at how Paul speaks of himself, we might draw the conclusion that Paul has a pretty, pretty poor self-esteem. Here he states uh, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. And this isn't something new that Paul's teaching. He says this about himself all the time. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. And then in Ephesians uh, chapter 3, verse 8, we see, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And finally, uh, from the book we just finished in Romans, uh, For I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. What we see happen here is Paul's, we might look at it and say, Paul, you've got a terrible self-esteem. You need to say some positive things about yourself. But I think what we're really having to look at here is Paul is rightly looking at a mirror and it's reflecting who he genuinely is in that mirror is the word of God as he holds himself up and looks at Christ and looks at himself and he realizes, man, I don't have this together. But he has it, for us, this is Paul. Who, if he doesn't have it together, I'm in real trouble. And so we, we have to really start looking at this. And I think of oftentimes of our lives is, is we go and we go in front of a mirror. And, and if we don't like what we see, well, we change kind of the thoughts of what we see. And when I look in the mirror in my bathroom, I'm still 20 years old and handsome with a full head of hair that rolls down my face. And I don't believe, what I think the mirror is lying to me. My wife then confirms, no, the mirror is accurate. You're a fat, bald man. Thanks a lot. But we have this notion where we really, we don't want to believe what the mirror says. Now there's even, and you women have it worse, because you have these mirrors that are round, and you look into them, and they magnify everything. And I don't know why you have those, but I, that is terrible. Get it out of your house now. <laughs> I've seen those. I go down the, the stores at the mall and I look into it and I go, ah! It's like a monster looking back at me. And then the lady goes, no, that's just you. No! The pores look like the craters from Mount St. Helens in my face. I mean, what is going on? I don't know why you women do that. It's a terrible idea. But ultimately, we, we have this notion we don't want to look in the mirror. And Paul here, I think, is rightly looking in the mirror and saying, no, this is who I am. I'm the least. I'm the greatest sinner. And I think for many of us, if we truly search our... Now, we didn't go killing uh, other Christians and persecuting the church. I think Paul might have that right. He might have me beat on that. But we do have this notion of really having to rightly reflect who are we before God. You see, we have to also remember that Paul is the same guy that said, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly now at length that you have received your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I'm in to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What Paul is, is identifying is my strength is not on my own. My strength is in God. Amen. And so when it comes down to how in the world do we right a sinking ship, and we don't, God does. And ultimately, if your life is in disarray, if it's being destroyed, if things are falling apart, you can't fix it on your own. You can try. You can give it the best effort you've got. But ultimately, you come to the end of the road and you've got to stand before God and God says, why didn't you ask me for help? I would have fixed it. And I would have taken you a completely different direction and it would have changed your world. And, and how often we, we neglect that notion of we, we want to deviate away. We want to steer it on our own. We don't want to listen to God's counsel. We don't want to listen to what God has for us. And I think one of the things that we ultimately, when it comes down to, to looking in the mirror and right, getting, getting a right reflection of who we are, is I think we have a horrible habit of lying that permeates our culture. 
I don't think it's just uh, just within uh, the body of Christ. I, I think this is just within humanity, and specifically us in the West, uh, meaning the Western part of the world. We have a horrible notion of being liars. And, and that's one of those things where what, what I mean by this is if somebody asks me how I'm doing, I'm doing great, fantastic, and, and we'll puff up how we're doing, and the reality is, man, life sucks. I got this going on, I got that going on. We, we're comfortable with that. Or let, let's see what even a little bit more cutting. Are you ready? Are you ready to get hit in the face? Somebody here, I guarantee, looked at porn this week. Somebody here, I guarantee, lied this week. Somebody here, I guarantee, stole this week. Somebody here, I guarantee, used God's name in vain this week. How you really doing? You see, what happens when we get into this notion of, this is, I, I want to kind of permeate, I want to dismiss the, the, the fact that these sins are really issues in my life, and I want to just kind of go and I'll, I'll sugarcoat it, and, and then things will be okay. Now, if you don't want to be honest with me, that's fine, but what happens in our lives is ultimately that manifests itself in our prayer life, and we're not honest before God. These sins aren't that big a deal. So I lied on my, on my taxes or on my payroll. It's not that big a deal. God, you know, God, forgive me. I know you'll forgive me. You're a gracious God. Thanks a lot. Without ever really, truly looking at the heart of what is driving my actions to do this. You want to know why people end up in a shipwreck? You want to know why churches end up in a shipwreck? It's because they forget to ask, why are we doing this? Why am I doing this sin that's in my life? What is, what is at the core of who I am that is driving me to do this? We don't want to ask that because it's more comfortable to accept the lie of everything's okay when really things aren't really that okay. We start looking to the core of who we are. We oftentimes don't like what we see. Can I tell you, that's where God meets you. That's where His grace is poured out. You see, all too often we want to neglect that and we live our lives and never fully receive and understand the true love that God has for us and the true magnitude of His grace for us. When I get into the depths of, my goodness, Lord, I can't even stop doing this. I, I want to stop, God. It's, it's in, within me. I desire to stop doing it. But God, I've got this battle between the flesh and, and the spirit, and I can't seem to beat it. God, will you meet me here? And that's where he meets you. And you realize the magnitude of, of this glorious grace and mercy he will pour out upon you. You see, that's the joy of living for Christ is it's not this depressed life, it's this genuine recognition of I know who I am, but I know who God is. And God loves me. And I want you to think of this, saints. God, we have the creator of the universe. Spoken into existence, just like that. This is the creator of the universe. Speaks the, the entirety of creation into, into matter, the, the being, and, and all of this. Puts everything in motion, and he loves you. You are the pinnacle of his creation because nothing else did he make in his image but you. We fell, of course. We have sin that has tarnished that. But he loves you enough that he redeemed you. That's this God we serve. And it starts by recognizing, one, who he is, but also, who are we? Why do I deserve this love? This is why the psalmist can say that. Who am I? And that's the beauty of this Lord that we serve is, is the reality, is, is who am I, God, that you would love me? I think that's what Paul is saying. And when we center back on that for our lives, we start, God, who am I that you would love me? You would account for me. That you would die for me. He said, requires us to give some honest feedback to ourselves. So whatever your most heinous sin was this week, turn to your neighbor and go ahead and share it with them. I'll give you a no. <laughs> That'd be funny if somebody did it. <laughs> ah, I can't believe you just said that. You're terrible. No, but that's really when we get down to this, that's kind of what we have to look at here is, is we do need to confess our sins with others. Not standing up here in church and doing it. But ultimately, have you? that's one of the beautiful things about a, a solid uh, relationship with your spouse is can you do that? Can you do it in love? A solid relationship with other, other believers. Can you do that? Can you confess before God and, and then go before your brothers or sisters in Christ and, and ask and, and receive assistance and help with that? 
But as we go on, we, we have to look at this, and, and Paul directs uh, Timothy specifically, stay in tune with God's call for you. And, and really what he's going here is, is, is it brings back and establishes that Timothy is at war. And I don't know if you know this, but you're in war. As soon as you wake up in the morning, the war starts. Some of you who have walked with Christ for a while know that. You get it. It's, it's a battle. i got to get up, my feet hit the ground, and already I'm attacked. Half the time for me, it's before I ever get out of bed. Oh, I hope such and such and such. I hope such. And I got this battle going on in my head already. But we have to look at this. There is warfare constantly, and this is a well-taught thing throughout the Scripture. We see uh, Christ says it uh, specifically to, to Peter. He's in Luke 22. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Again, in 1 Peter, uh, now this is who... Christ was just talking about, and Peter's now going to talk about the, the war in 1 Peter 5, 8. But be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking, lion, seeking someone to devour. In Ephesians, where we're told to put on the whole armor of God, you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, uh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So ultimately, one of the things when we lie, we lie about this, with this warfare that we're in. Understand that you're at war and there is a war for your soul. Now you may not think that you're that important in God's scheme of things, but God does. And Satan, and Satan does not like God, by the way. He wants to supplant God and take over. He can't because he's a created being. You know, we can get into that another day. But, but he's a created angel that fell. But he can't go after God, so what's he going to do? He's going to go after that which God loves, and that's you. So you're in the war whether you want to be or not. And what's interesting is, is the stories that people will tell of all the events that happen on a Sunday morning. Kids throw the cereal on the ground, milk gets spilled. I spilled milk all over myself today, drinking out of one of my daughter's stupid little bowls. Has all these lips around it. I go up to drink the milk, and it pours out the side. None of it gets in my mouth. Pours out the side and all down me. Are you kidding me? It's five minutes before I have to get out the door. And that's just simple. What about the chaos that happens in some homes where that's when kids decide to act out? Why? God, because Satan doesn't want you here. God wants you here. Satan doesn't want you to come in here and hear God's word. Doesn't want you around brothers and sisters in Christ. He wants to separate you out. He wants to sift you out, isolate you, and kill you. Spiritually, if he can't do it physically, he'll do it spiritually. And how often do we give in? You see, one of the things we fail to recognize is we are at war all the time. And, and it's one of those things, that's why we have to cling to Christ, because I can't win the war. The war's already been won. It's to claim my victory and cling to Christ in the midst of that. And so we look at this in terms of how do we do that, where well, we have to hold on to our faith and live a life of good conscience. And, and Paul states in the letter to the Ephesians, do not give the devil a foothold. Don't even give him an inch of ground. Because if he can get a foothold, he's going to weasel his way all the way in. So we don't even give him a foothold. And these are all things that we look at when we start grounding this and understanding that, that really we're in a war, that the whole point of our lives is to live out the gospel of Christ and to embrace the salvation that we've received. How do you avoid being shipwrecked? You deviate from the path. Here, how, do you, how do you get shipwrecked? You deviate from the path. How do you avoid it? You stay on the path. And ultimately, there's two gentlemen who are named here, Hymenaeus. And Alexander, somewhere along the line, they went the wrong direction. They were with Paul. They were talking with Paul. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't say, I handed him over to Satan. But ultimately, somewhere along the lines, they went wrong. The same thing has happened to this church at, at Ephesus. Somewhere along the lines, they went wrong. This church at Timothy, somewhere along the lines, they went wrong. And now it's time to right the ship. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know if, if perhaps you, you've, you've kind of turned away, if you've walked away, or maybe you haven't even accepted Christ as your Savior. If that's you, I pray that today you would. It's a free gift. Uh, you are guilty before God. Whether you want to be or not, you're guilty. But it's God's grace that will save you. But maybe you're already saved and you've walked away and you're going through tragedy, you're going through turmoil, you're going through chaos, and you're, you're running right up against the rocks. Your ship can be righted. It starts by really recognizing, I don't know if, if you guys do this, but, but I, I, at times when I have difficulty with my faith, and this does happen, when I'm get, I just get down or, or various things go on in my life, I'm like, man, I'm just getting bogged down. 
There are some times when I go back to the moment of salvation. The moment I received Christ and I remember how true and how perfect it was. And, and it's one of those benchmark points in my life. I can remember, I don't know the exact seat in the church, but I remember approximately where it was. I remember the pastor. I can, I can see the scene very well, and I remember at that moment everything else that had been happening that led me to that point made sense. And God, and God called me and said, you're mine. And sometimes we have to go back to that very moment and remember that's when I got saved. That's when I received eternal life. I want you to start living that out. Today we're going to do uh, baptisms. And that's another one of those moments in your life. I remember when I got baptized, it was at Whitworth Pool uh, with Calvary Chapel in Spokane. We're at Whitworth Pool. We go in, and there's got to be about 50 people there, and I'm the only adult. All these little kids, and I remember thinking, are you kidding me? <laughs> Couldn't they do a separate one for me? And I'm getting up, and, and, and I'm a little self-conscious, and I'm like, oh, all these little kids, am I doing something wrong? And I hope they don't pee in the pool and all, the, all these other things. And so as we get up there, I, I get the pastor that actually was preaching when I committed my life to Christ. And he dunks me and pulls me up. I remember the whole scene, and I gave him a hug because nobody had given him a hug yet, and I got him soaking wet. And I don't know that he knew what to do with that because he kind of moved me up. Get up. <laughs> but it's one of those benchmarks of... We get those points in life where sometimes when we're in the midst of it, we have to remember the grace of God. And that's what these, these high points are, these benchmarks are. So if you're there, if you're in the midst of chaos, in the midst of turmoil, lean back and recognize the truth that you know God loves you. The truth that you know God is there. The truth that you know you're guilty before God, but it's by His grace and His mercy that He's willing to pour it out on you. And live there. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, Lord, truly what a gift it is that you've given us. Father, that we can love you and that we can approach you. And it is only by your grace. Father, I, I thank you for the letter here to Timothy uh, that, that Paul has sent to this young leader. I pray that we would uh, pour this into our own lives. And Lord, that it would filter uh, not only to us individually, but as we consider these words over the, the next few weeks, Lord, that it would impact our lives as a church as well. That we'd see your hand at work in the design and structure of, of what it is you've called us to do as we uh, live out our faith in this body of believers. And Father, for those here today who are struggling and, and, and having a difficult time with, with whatever's going on in life, Lord, I pray for them. I pray that, that you would protect them, but Lord, that you would draw them to you through the Holy Spirit. That in their lives they would uh, realize that we don't have the answers and sometimes we take the wrong turn, even though we think we're going the right direction we end up on the rocks. Lord, I pray before their ship is battered and, and beaten and destroyed, Lord, that they would submit themselves unto you for rescue and for safety. I pray this in Jesus' name.